<laughs> well, my fruits, welcome to the broadcast. Today, we have a special guest. We have her from England. We have Megan from America. Welcome. Hello. Just as one thought that it couldn't get any more vulgar. I, how many awards do they want to buy? How many more awards do they want to buy to convince the world how philanthropic and charitable they are? What? What? Is it true? What? Yeah. Yes, 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 it's true. It's true. <laughs> It seems to be never ending. That bugler is going to be running out of puff. That royal bugler from Montecito, that herald, that lick spittle. <laughs> yeah, keep tooting away, keep trumping your horn, my dear, to let the whole world know how fabulous Prince Harry is. <laughs> <laughs> Persuading everybody to take drugs and go into therapy and how charitable and philanthropic the Duchess is. <laughs> the true princess, the true queen. Ain't she wonderful? Anyway, we'll hold off on that for just a few seconds because I want to begin with something a little bit more edifying. First of all, we have a new uh, fruit in the basket in the form of Queen Alexandra here. Isn't she wonderful? Isn't she glorious? Truly queenly. I found her at the Vintage Fair for six pounds. <laughs> Going for six pounds she was. No one wants Queen Alexandra anymore. Alexandra was the consort of King Edward VII back in the day. Yes, she was. But we don't forget her, do we, my dears? No, we don't. There she is. Looking extremely royal. And today is the first day that King Charles's portrait will appear on all standard Royal Mail stamps. Yes, from today. And it is unique. Our stamps are unique in that only the image of the monarch is needed. And we don't write the name of the kingdom or the nation on our stamps, not uh, our regular stamps. I'm sure in a few editions, special editions there might be, but we are quite unique in that the monarch's head is all that is required. And as you've seen, Charles personally approved his images and he wanted no regalia, no laurel, no crown, no fuss. The bad news is that the cost of the stamps has gone up. First class are up 15p as of yesterday to £1.10 and second class stamps are up by 7p to 75 pence. Over a pound now for a first class stamp. Would you believe it? £1.10. But the post office will continue using up their existing stock of the late Elizabeth for the time being. But you'll gradually begin to see them coming into circulation from now on. And by the way, I'm glad I mentioned making sure and checking that you've subscribed to my channel if you wanted to be subscribed. I was quite overwhelmed. About a thousand of you, over a thousand of you, clicked to subscribe when I mentioned that at the beginning of the last broadcast. And many of you told me you found yourself unsubscribed or hadn't realised that you weren't subscribed and over a thousand just within a few hours uh, subscribed. So I, I guess, although I don't like channels that are continually going on in every broadcast, subscribe, subscribe, blah, blah, blah. So you will not find me doing that, uh, no matter how effective it is. You won't find me doing that very often. But now I've seen that it can yield <laughs> some fruit, then I will be doing so every so often, but not enough to get on your nerves, I hope. So onwards to this grifting, this further announcement of another award. <laughs> I mean, it's, it is pantomime. It is pan, pantomimian, my dear. Meghan, the, <laughs> oh God. the Duchess of Sussex will receive the highest honor of a Women in Vision Award from the feminist icon, Gloria Steinem at a gala in New York next month. We're all going to be so excited for that, aren't we? To watch her swanning in there. <laughs> and you can grab a ticket. It's only $1,500 for a ticket. Or uh, uh, if you want a whole table, that's a steal at 15K. 15K a table. For global advocacy to empower and advocate on behalf of women and girls. Do you hear that, ladies? It's on behalf of you that she's been advocating all these years. Remember when she changed the world by writing off to, what was it, fairy liquid? The washing up detergent people. 
wrote it, and they all clambered around the board executive meeting and learned what was key from this little usurper. We've had this, this missive from a young child by the name of M Madame Thomasina Marco. And she has told us exactly where we're going wrong with our washing up liquid, our detergent. And I think that she is going to be queen of the United Kingdom in a few years. And everybody fell in line. No, my dear, your whole class wrote. It was Thomas Markle's idea and uh, all these kinds of things. We know what it's all about. And I was watching footage of her the other day going on. I'm sure many of you have seen it. it was This old video popped up about 10 years old when she was in suits or whatever. And she was talking about when I worked at the embassy. When I worked at... You interned you imbecile, you interned. There is a world of difference between working for an embassy in Argentina. You know, that's where you got your Jones to be Evita. No. Other winners include the BLM co-founder, Latosha Brown. Sounds like a drag queen, doesn't it? They are all, they say, incredible leaders and we are grateful to be, shine a light on their many accomplishments and tireless work on behalf of gender and racial equity, equity across the country and the world. Well, I am not going to speak on America and the need for a Black Lives Matter movement there. I mean, there's some things about the beginning of that movement that I will never quite understand, but I'm not going to go there in the video. But I do understand that a reckoning needed to be had uh, of some sorts. I think it's unfortunate how it transpired and some of the reverberating effects of that movement. And we all know the sinister goings on that have been reported within it and the financing of it. However, that for now is America's business. But I've been very dismayed to see here in the kingdom, and many people will tell you, is a total regression from the wonderful leaps and strides we've made over the decades. Much of it, this uh, new sense of bad feeling and caution and sensitivities and sort of friction and tension rubbed up by Meghan Markle herself under the stewardship of her husband's permission, that affair, and uh, by Black Lives Matter representatives in England doing their business over here and setting back race relations. It hasn't helped, it has harmed, it has harmed, it has divided and provided a sense of awkwardness all over the place, cancel culture all over the place, meritocracy going out of the window, in favour for special privileges. The sense of proportion and the sense of reason has been lost. Meghan's profile tells us that she is noted as one of the most powerful and influential women in the world. Topping lists such as Time Magazine's Most Influential, The Financial Times' 25 Most Influential Women, Variety's Power of Women, and British Vogue's Vogue 25. Most influential, influential, yeah, she's an influencer. She is the, a bad influence. That's what she is, my dear, a bad influence. After I spoke about King Charles the other day and said that quite a few of you have said that he looks a little bit vampiric in some of his photographs of late, especially over the past year, I had quite a few comments from others of you who say that he puts you in mind of uh, the grandpa from the Munsters. <laughs> and I can absolutely see it, especially when he's in all his regalia for the state, uh, the state banquet with the red sash and everything. Yes, he is. He's Grandpa Munster, isn't he? Uh, slightly unfortunate. Uh, and Nanya says, overall, I liked the painting of the king that you showed, but I wish he had a crown on or something spectacular. A hundred years from now, he will just look like a nice old man. Well, I see your point, my dear, but this uh, official portrait that was unveiled last week is not going to be the official coronation portrait. And some have been misunderstanding that because it's been announced this week by the government that public authorities throughout the kingdom will be able to apply for a free portrait of His Majesty the King, fully funded by the UK government as part of a scheme to celebrate the new reign. And my understanding is that this new portrait will not be a painted one, it will be a photographic portrait, which is uh, preferable, isn't it? And I've really got my fingers crossed that he's going to be in some sort of regalia, you know, as grand as possible. I don't, I don't mind. They're not just sitting there in some bland suit, but who knows? He seems to have rather modest tastes and is going to be dressing down the coronation in all kinds of ways. 
So we have to hope for a little bit of bling, you know, something rather grand and kingly, but at least we know that it won't be based on that rather bland portrait that was unveiled last week, where, as you say, he just looks like a rather kindly older gentleman. Councils, courts, schools, police forces and fire and rescue services will be among the public institutions across the length and breadth of the kingdom to be offered a new official portrait of His Majesty funded by the government. And the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster said, we have entered a new reign in our history. Now, as we unite in preparing for the splendour of the King's coronation, these new portraits will serve as a visible reminder in buildings up and down the country of the nation's ultimate public servant. Now, there has been a lot of consternation in the press and a lot of outrage because it's reported that £8 million is being spent on this and it's being called shameful by anti-monarchists. And I've got to say, if it's true and they are shelling out £8 million to fund this venture, that is a lot of money and doesn't sit very comfortably with me. However, however, there is another side to consider. Yes, eight million pounds could have been spent on homelessness. You know, that's what most critic people who are criticizing will say, why can't it go to the homeless? Why can't it go to charity, blah, blah, blah. One has to speculate to accumulate or, I don't know, to be more accurate. Sometimes one has to give a little to get a lot. And this is the foundation of Charles's reign this moment, this upcoming coronation. This is the, the founding moment for a reign that could last for 25 years, could be a lot less, might be a couple more, but you know, for a 25 year reign. And one of the reasons that the royal family and the monarchy and the late Elizabeth's reign was so very successful was her brand Think of the physical implications of that word, brand, as you brand your own cattle or you brand, you know, scorching an image, searing it into published public consciousness. I talk about this kind of thing quite a lot when it comes to the royal family, uh, from the iconography of the stamps to on currency. If it's going to be strong, it needs a strong image and it needs to be there from the outset. So I do believe that it is important to offer these portraits to all of our public offices and places that will take them and councils. And the way that I justify royal spending as a whole is that personally, even though I pay for them as a taxpayer, it is a minute fraction. I think it's less than a pound or uh, very close to a pound annually that it costs me. And if you're anti-monarchist, then you have the right not to want that pound to go towards the royalty. Uh, the royal family. I'm not going to lose any sleep over it, but you know, that's uh, that's down to an individual. But one of the ways that I look at it is the advantages and the disadvantages. I weigh up the balance of what is spent and what we give to them and what they generate, what they are able to promote. The hundreds of charitable institutions that all, all the royal members of the royal family prop up to have a member of the royal family, even a uh, lesser known royal, uh, Princess Alexandra, or a Duke of Gloucester, or Prince, uh, Princess Michael of Kent, whatever. Just an association has extreme power for fundraising with charities. That's why they're clamouring to be seen with them every week on all the occasions that I show you in my broadcasts. Just that few photographs or a luncheon or even deeper involvement that a lot of the mem members of the royal family have with their patronages that last for decades. It's extremely powerful. It generates a hell of a lot more than eight million quid. And this is over many decades. So I understand why the government, because this is the government's decision to fund this, not the royal families or the institution of the monarchies, it's the government's decision to pour this money. You know, if people want to have ire or anger about this kind of thing, that has to go to His Majesty's government who are making those decisions, not to His Majesty or the King, because it's more or less out of his hands where the pennies go in this case. It's also reported that the coronation in its entirety is going to be bringing in billions rather than millions to the British economy just in those few weeks, or in that week even, perhaps, you know, the run up to it, everything surrounding. I've seen some estimates going up to four and a half billion. I'm not sure quite which is true, one billion or four and a half, but we're talking in the billions here. So we have to think of that maxim that Queen Elizabeth lived by, which was one has to be seen to be believed. And this kind of imagery 
is extremely important. And indeed, it should serve as a reminder. It should serve as a royal reminder to those who are working in public institutions and councils, town halls, all the rest of it, whether they're for or against the monarchy. And I'm sure many of them are probably against it these days. Well, it's a reminder that it is His Majesty's government and that he is, whether you like it or not, our head of state. And this is a free country and you have perfect entitlement and right to lobby against the royal family, the abolition of it. I'm sure that it will be successful one day, that's my feeling, uh, as the nation cares less and less for royalty. But as it stands, they have majority support. And if you lobby away, as you're doing, and protesting away, all you ones that want a republic, uh, you're free to do that. And you can lobby away until you have some generic head of state, some leader, some president, some prime minister, the same as everybody else, boring, 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 and no neutral head of state. It, uh, and once you've got that, then you can toss out all the photographs of our head of state. But there's no point in denying that that is what our monarchy is at this moment in time, my jeers. Now, this is really heartwarming and really rather lovely for those of you that like the natural world, as King Charles does. And for those like me, you know, I always say to you, my favourite sort of bouquet will be a bouquet or a nosegay or a sprig of wildflowers, you know, with the scent of unadulterated nature. Uh, beautiful, uh, naturally sourced from the meadows. What could be nicer? Well, English Heritage has vowed to restore 100 wildflower meadows at historic sites across the country to celebrate the coronation by creating a lasting environmental legacy. This project works to revive the country's lost flower-rich grasslands in tribute to Charles's love of the natural world. And this made me so sad to read. And I was aware of the diminishing countryside in the kingdom over the last century. It's horrifying when you look at how much of it's gone. Uh, you know, we're still blessed with uh, the most gorgeous scenery, I think, anywhere in the world, to be quite honest. We're still blessed with it, but we've lost a great deal of it. 97%, 97% of the UK's grasslands have disappeared since the 1930s. So in less than 100 years, 97% of these grasslands and there are many remaining fragments that are left unprotected. So there will be a hundred of these wildflower meadows created at English heritage castles, palaces, and prehistoric stone circle sites, including Stonehenge and the Jewel Tower in London. They will either be created newly, I think 75% of them will be created brand new, or existing ones will be enhanced. So what a beautiful, glorious legacy that is so fitting in relation to King Charles and his own passions. And another lover of the natural world who is wont to protect it is the new Prince of Wales. And William has appointed Jacinda Ardern as a trustee of his Earthshot Prize. Kensington Palace confirmed today, and Prince William said four years ago before the Earthshot Prize even had a name, Jacinda was one of the first people I spoke to, and her encouragement and advice was crucial to the prize's early success. I'm hugely grateful to her as she takes the next steps in her career. And remember in September, last September, when the Queen died, Jacinda attended a summit that was hosted by the Earthshot Prize in New York. Do you remember that? She spoke on William's behalf because he remained in the United Kingdom following Elizabeth's death. So no matter what you think about Jacinda, whether you've got Winder, Jacinda or not, because like any political figure, she has her lovers and loathers, whatever you think about, she's earned her stripes with regard to the prize and William's been grateful for her help. So that is that. Anyway, on to Carol Middleton. William's mother-in-law. Tough times for Carol Middleton, apparently, because party pieces, remember we spoke about it launching in the United States, where well, it's been going through tough times. It was founded by Carol. Uh, she, it seems that she's appointed Interpath to advise on strategic options, which could include a sale or outside investor funding. That's a shame, isn't it? Everybody loves party pieces. You're looking for an investor, my dear. Try Archerwell. They've got some mystery benefactors, I'm sure. They're well, they might be a bit precious about pushing them your way, but hey. Advisors have been hired on struggling with dwindling sales. 
Carol and Michael Middleton became embroiled in a row with suppliers, apparently, which uh, resulted in them suffering a dip in sales during the crucial Christmas period. That's when all the sales are important. And a spokesman said, we're working with our advisors to secure additional investment which will help support the business as we look to embark on the next phase of our growth plan. Well, it's her party pieces and she'll cry if she wants to. And now to the subject of the most intriguing lady, otherwise known as Fergie the Lurgy. She was touting her wares with Ryland Clark on Radio 2 last week, you know, and she wore that pink PVC tablecloth again. At the age of 63, she wore velvet slippers emblazoned with a crown. Her book is going to be adapted for television, you know. The most intriguing lady. I think I should play the role, don't you? I think they should cast me. I can dye the locks raving red. Get my toes sucked. The most intriguing, really. That'll be me. <laughs> and also, well, she's going to be on Loose Women today. And she was on This Morning with Holly and Joel. For those of you in the kingdom, Joel Dummett, or whatever his name is. Useless presenter. Yeah, he's competent at hosting uh, silly sort of karaoke shows. But they drafted him in uh, to, temp to temporarily replace Philip Schofield while he's off. And... Uh, it just blows my mind how incompetent he is. It's another part of this dumbing down culture, which is why I'm mentioning it. He is not capable. They should have a rota of people that can go off the ground running for that prime position job. He just sits there <laughs> with those teeth and occasionally comes out with something completely unnecessary. Complete. It was painful and embarrassing to watch. Painful and embarrassing. And no, I don't want the job. I'm not after it. But I could literally waltz in there now and do ten times better than he could next to Holly Willoughby. Ten times better. I digress. Of course, they tried to sneak in some questions about the Harkles. And as usual, Fergie just mumbled stuff and nonsense. She's never going to reveal anything worth revealing. She just wants eyes on her to sell the book. She said, it's Beatrice, usually and I, sort of on the subject of Prince Andrew as well. She said, we're a family unit. My girls stand for service. They stand for holding and maintaining very, very hard jobs and their mothers and their public figures. And they do charity work. Extraordinary examples of princesses out in service, which is what their grandmother taught them and what I taught them with humility. And I actually agree. By and large, I think they're both fantastic, especially Beatrice, but both of them are fantastic. And they've been through a lot over the last few years. Anyway, so she says that, so I think the York family symbolises no judgment, kindness and moving forward. To make people sit up and go, stop, stop all this believing what you read. Walk forward as a unit. Remember, I've been through difficult times and Andrew has always stuck by me. Well, very good. You know, she goes on this, this is a shtick. She goes on this kindness rant whenever she's asked any awkward questions. I believe in kindness. I believe, you know. Sometimes you've got to be cruel to be kind, Fergie, my love. And sometimes you've got to kill him with kindness, my dear. Princess Huge is getting huge. And her bump was on display with Jack Brooksbank at a wedding in Mayfair. At 33 years old, she wore Veronica beard, a Max Mara camel coat, which was very nice. Uh, an M2M Atelier crossbody bag and a thick, ugly headband. And this will be her second child following little Oggy. Oggy, Oggy, Oggy. Oi, oi, oi. We love little Oggy Porgy. And also there was Cressy Bonbons. You know Harry's ex? Yes, Cressy Bonbons. She was in attendance at this gathering. And usually arrived emerging from a traditional red London bus. And old Jackie Brooks Bank, he wore his usual affable grin and a yellow tie. And the press have been making much about Fergie's partying lately because she's always gathering around town, isn't she? Always gathering around Mayfair, having a splendid time at all these private members' clubs, yes, because she's got a crash pad just next door, hasn't she? With her new four and a half million pound muse house in Belgravia, my dear. And she's always having the time of her life in her slippers, tiptoeing around Mayfair, trotting around. Harry's, Oswald's, Mark's. Maison Estelle, Annabelle's, and Lulu's, Lulu's, yes. 
well, they're going on about the fact that it's going to be selling about 10,000 a year for membership. I wouldn't imagine that she pays her own membership fees, my dear. I mean, I've been to some of these places. I don't pay. The very idea of paying for a subscription, my dear, honestly. You go as a guest or you get invited, you know, if you're in the know. I, I personally think it's vulgar to pay. To pay? I've never queued in a nightclub queue. And I've been to thousands of nightclubs, <laughs> my dear. We either know the DJ or the curator of these events or the people behind the scenes or those in the industry uh, and get on the guest list. If I wasn't on the guest list, you, th you see these people snaking around the block at nightclubs. Uh, snaking around the block, I'm sorry. I just got too much self-respect. I, I, I believe I've done it a few times when I've been abroad in Europe and it's been a random night out with friends and we haven't had any contact, uh, you know, no contacts in the area, you know, random night out. And then of course, if it's a rather gentle little queue, you, you line up and they stamp your hand with a hard little thing. Uh, that is not what I'm used to, my dear, not in my world, but you know, it shouldn't be in your world, you know, either, you know, arrange, arrange your world so that you're not one that has to queue up the hoi polloi, my dear. That is not royal. <laughs> It's not a question of being snobby. You can come from very humble beginnings. Uh, and one of my very close associates is from very humble beginnings, very humble beginnings. And she knows how to hustle. <laughs> she hustles marvelously. It's about being resourceful, getting to know the right people, getting in there, always getting to know the DJ. I mean, the very thought of paying to enter a nightclub or some kind of establishment like that, no, my dear. You get on the guest list and you get your drinks tokens, my love. Thank you very much for joining me and Queen Alexandra thanks you as well, don't you, my dear? Yes. Yes, we thank you very much for joining me. Yes, another broadcast, another cardigan. For those that are asking why I'm wearing so much knitwear lately, I'm just trying to get the most juice out of this turn of the season. You know me by now, my dears, I'm going to be so miserable in a few weeks, probably by next week, because there's already a bit of sunshine coming through today. I, I prefer it milder. I like the turn of the seasons, whether it's fall or, or to a lesser extent spring. So I'm making the most of cashmere cardigan season <laughs> because it's my favorite thing to wear. Soon it will be too hot to do podcasts in it. I'm making the most of it. But for now, in my cozy cardigan, I give you all a royal and regal hug and say to Ra for now, my dears, thank you for watching. Thanks to anybody who sent a little bit of tip jar money my way to treat myself to a coffee or a slice of cake. It is truly, truly appreciated. Thank you very much. And uh, I will see you in the next broadcast. So, ta for now, my dears, and toodle-pay.